Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Pat Hanlon, and I'm serving as acting chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals for uh, tonight's meeting. And I'm calling the meeting of the board to order at 7.32 p.m. Uh, I'd like to confirm that all members and anticipated officials are uh, present. So starting with the members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, Mr. Klein. Here. Mr. DuPont. Here. Ms. Hoffman. Here. Mr. Holy. Here. Mr. LeBlanc. Here. And Mr. Riccardelli. Here. And in case anybody asks, I'm here too. Um, the board's 40B advisor, uh, Mr. Uh, Haverty, you here? Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Haverty. Uh, the board's peer review consultant, Mr. Reardon from Tetra Tech. I am here. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Sean. Uh, town officials, I believe Colleen Ralston, our zoning assistant, isn't here. She's enjoying uh, frigid temperatures in the Arctic. Um, Vincent Lee, are you here? I am here. Thank you very much for setting us all up in Colleen's absence. I really appreciate your willingness to do that. Um, appearing for the applicant uh, in uh, 10 Sunnyside Avenue, uh, Ms. O'Connor. I'm here. Uh, Ms. Schwartz. Yes, here. Okay. And in the, I, guess, I guess I should ask, I'll let... Uh, Ms. O'Connor introduced the cast of characters when we finally get to that point. Uh, but Ms. O'Connor, is everybody that you expect to be here here? Uh, I'm assuming so. I'm calling you, Pat, from my phone because my electricity is out. So oh um, I think Bald Hill Build Builders is on the line, Util Architecture, Samiotis Engineering, Niche Engineering, and our consultant, Gabriel Geller. Okay, I, I see somebody from all of those companies and the individuals are there. So they, you all look here. Um, the, um, I think that's, that's all that we need to do at this point. Um, the, on our agenda, we have first a, uh, excuse me, first thing we'll do is introduce remote meetings. Um, this is where everybody could take a little bit of a snooze who hasn't heard this before, of which I think there's almost nobody on this call. Uh, but this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely consistent with an act making appropriations for the fiscal year 2023 to provide for supplementing certain existing appropriations and for certain other activities and projects, which was signed into law on March 29th, 2023. This act includes an extension until March 31st, 2025 of the remote meeting participate uh, provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location, so long as they provide adequate alternative access to remote meetings. Public bodies may meet remotely as so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period of each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website. Uh, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference, others by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and your screen name or another identifier. So please take care not to share personal information. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask that you please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate uh, background. All supporting materials that have been provided to the members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. As chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of public uh, promoting an orderly meeting, but tonight I don't really intend to do this. As the board will take, be taking up new business at this meeting, as chair, I make the following land acknowledgement. 
whereas the Zoning Board of Appeals for the Town of Arlington, Massachusetts discusses and arbitrates the use of land in Arlington, formerly known as Monotomy, and Algonquin word meaning swift waters. The board hereby acknowledges that the town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral um, body bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic uh, Massachusetts territories today. So now we've gotten through the formalities, uh, we're back to something new. And the first item on our agenda um, is an administrative item. Uh, items of this kind relate to the operation of the board and as such will be generally conducted without input uh, from the general public. The board will not take up any new business on prior hearings, nor will there be introduction of any new information on matters previously brought before the board. Uh, the issue on the agenda is approval of the written decision in docket number 3753 uh, at 60 to 62 Magnolia Street. This case was heard by the board on July 27, 2023. A draft opinion was prepared by me and distributed to the board for comment. A revised opinion was distributed by me again earlier this day uh, and is before the board. And I have to alert you that having printed that out just a few moments ago, I realized that there were a couple of formatting um, changes that were made on that final, which has ruined the appearance of the whole business because now it has uh, a, comment on, uh, a comment column on every page, but none of those comments actually have to do with the text. They all have to do with the length of the line, of the signature lines. Um, does anyone have any further comments or questions on the opinion? Okay, seeing none, the chair will entertain a motion uh, to approve the revised opinion. Mr. Chair, so moved. Mr. DuPont, so moved. Is, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Riccardelli. Um, we'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Klein. I was not a voting member of the board on that decision. Do you want my vote? Um, well, you, yes, our general practice actually is to have everybody vote, although the only people who are the signing and the operative people are the ones who actually heard the decision uh, themselves. But the um, so just in an abundance of caution, I just as soon have your vote and that of the other people who uh, that there must be one other person who did not participate in that decision as well. In that case, I would vote aye. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Uh, Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. Holy. Aye. Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. Mr. Riccardelli. Aye. Okay, so the motion carries uh, unanimously. Uh, and now we're ready to uh, start on the main item. And that is the uh, continuation of the public hearing in uh, 10 Sunnyside. Uh, the, uh, before opening the hearings, here are some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. Um, you've heard this before, but not for a few weeks. Um, after I announce the agenda item, which I just did, I will ask the applicants to introduce themselves or and to make their presentation to the board. I'll then request the members of the board ask what questions they have on the proposals. And after those questions have been answered, um, I will be opening the, uh, the public hearing. Tonight's hearing is going to be devoted primarily to the initial comments of Mr. Reardon, uh, the board's peer review consultant, uh, who we briefly introduced uh, when we took the roll call in the beginning. Uh, these comments will generally address civil engineering and transportation aspects of the case. Um, after Mr. Reardon presents his comments, uh, the applicant will briefly respond. Mr. Reardon will shortly issue a written report addressing a broader range of questions, in but including these. Uh, that report will be put on the board's website as soon as it becomes available, and the board will take up that report and the applicant's more detailed responses at its next meeting. Uh, tonight, also, the applicant will uh, address some issues that were raised uh, at prior sessions of this hearing. Um, I want to alert everyone that uh, the board will hold several additional sessions of this hearing. 
Um, at the next session, as I've mentioned before, the board will take up the applicant's response to Mr. Reardon's written report uh, and any additional matters that the board feels that it needs to explore. And I'd encourage all of the members before that hearing to think through whatever and review the record and, and think through whatever matters uh, that they need additional uh, additional learning on. Um, the final hearing, uh, which uh, that it, well, it could be that in terms of dealing with all the factual matters, we'll need more than one hearing, but we won't need more than two. Uh, the final hearing that we have will be a session where uh, we've got a, a, a report, a draft report, uh, written or not report, but decision uh, written by uh, Mr. Haverty. Um, the purpose of having this last hearing is to give the public and the applicant an opportunity to express their views on various proposed uh, matters that the for the that the that the draft opinion uh, uh, will address. Um, that I anticipate being one evening, and at the end of that evening, uh, we will, uh, unless something strange happens. Uh, we will close the public hearing in this case. Closing the public hearing in this case is an important thing because, for one thing, we have a time limit uh, within which we have to do that. But also, it sets a new time limit for the board to make a decision. It has, as I recall, 40 days after that um, to decide uh, the case. During that period, the board cannot hear from anybody in writing or orally uh, or in any other way, uh, uh, secret spirits or whatever, um, until we've decided the case, uh, with the exception that we will be, be consulting Mr. Haverty on uh, drafting questions and questions of proper form. Um, and if necessary, we may seek legal opinion from town council. Um, but no, the public part of the public hearing is now over and uh, we will have to decide the case on our own and without the benefit of further guidance uh, from, from uh, either the public or the applicant. Um, so we're looking maybe at three more hearings or two, depending upon how fast things go. Uh, and so it's, it, it's time for us to begin to focus on uh, resolving all the loose ends and making sure that uh, we're able uh, we're able to proceed. With that, uh, we'll open the public hearing. I guess the logical thing to do is to hear from Mr. Reardon first. Um, and uh, so I'd like to just introduce everyone to him. His role is as board consultant. Uh, he is providing us with expert opinion on the matters that having to do with civil engineering and transportation. Um, he is uh, he is answerable to uh, the board, and his function is to assist the board in dealing with the, some certain te technical aspects of the case. Uh, Mr. Reardon has served in that capacity before with some distinction, and uh, we're very happy, Sean, to have you uh, to have you here again uh, to have you here again tonight. Uh, to help. Mr. Reardon, uh, the floor is yours. Sure. So, yep, again, my name is Sean Reardon. I'm a vice president with Tetra Tech. We're uh, basically an, a large engineering firm in Marlboro. We're about 15,000 employees worldwide, but our focus is mostly on sort of entitlement of land development projects. So um, a lot of my responsibilities revolve around permitting similar projects and designing similar projects, but we also serve as a review authority for a lot of different boards and, and committees. Um, so first takeaway, we, we reviewed everything that's been submitted to date so far. And, um, you know, real, real important initial takeaway is the submittal quality was excellent, right? E everything was readable, well presented, looked great, um, comprehensive, clean. So, you know, that usually gets things off to a good start and usually um, portends that uh, the thought behind the project is, is similar, and we found that to be the case as well. That we, you know, thought it was well, everything was well thought, complete, um, and in particular, we were we were very very happy to see um, you know such a, a focus on bike accommodations. So um, rather than sort of having to twist people's arm about providing adequate bike bike space, it seems to be a pretty robust consideration for this project, which is good considering its location. Um, location excellent. You know, it's got. You know, basically few residential butters, um, you know, some close by neighborhoods, but 
you know, the way I look at this is this is just an extension of the neighborhood because this is just going to be another group of people and homeowners or, or renters, but, um, you know, another residential component that's going to sort of add to the community. Um, great access to public transportation. It's got a, a stop right up the street um, and it, within a very walkable neighborhood. So a lot of services close by. So all, all good from the initial, initial takeaway. Um, we did have a meeting with the applicants team, um, was it last week? Gosh, it's going by, yeah, it's like right. it yesterday, was it? Um, and uh, really just to preview some of my initial thoughts and comments, get some sort of initiation to some action on some of my questions so that we can turn around information quickly. Um, no big surprise or scary issues, really just to sort of in the interest of disclosing certain things and working through certain issues that people may haven't thought of, you know, maybe like to see a bit more documentation. Um, main points that we discussed at that meeting, number one, sort of the constructability challenges that come from having a building that occupies most of the site. Um, that being said, they have provided a sort of a, a reasonable setback along all three or four sides. Um, that allows the building to be and their foundations to be constructed with without too much um, issue. What we did see is a, a challenge is that the site is surrounded by a retaining wall that holds back the adjoining property. So in order to remove that retaining wall, there might be some sort of impacts off site that would have to be managed and um, sort of cleared with the abutters. Um, the other thing we, we had hoped to sort of get a clearer understanding from the applicant was is like how are they going to basically support construction if you figure the entire site is taken up by the building that doesn't leave any space for a construction trailer doesn't leave any space for parking of contractors material lay down deliveries things like that so um, in the interest of just making sure we all have a, a similar expectation in mind and the board's informed as as informed as possible as what, what their specific plans are it like good to have a little bit more understanding on how that was going to be achieved because there are obviously you know there are public safety issues that are associated with that that i think need to be vetted a little bit um also to the extent that they're going to need to use the public way i think that's probably helpful to have a discussion similar to the discussion we had at 1025 mass ave now this is a much lower volume street obviously um, i was out there earlier today I, I don't think i saw a single car go by um, so it's in terms of just its location, I don't, I don't think it's a sort of a, a, a super scary um, proposition to, for them to use a portion of the right of way, but it, but it is public way with pedestrian access. So it, it, it should get discussed and at least sort of quantified in some, some way. Um, then uh, we had some sort of minor concerns about sedimentation and erosion controls. Again, site's gonna be almost all building. So, um, you know, I know their site prep plan has an erosion control barrier that's on the face of curb along the street. Don't know if that's really a practical thing we want to have happen, um, but we're going to have to need to think that through a little bit. So, for example, yeah, there's going to have to be soil stockpiled somewhere. It's not going to be on site because they're going to have foundation construction. So we just need to have a little bit better understanding on how they're gonna manage materials so that we don't find a lot of that stuff finding its way into the street. All things that I think are, are, are solvable or could be definable as part of a condition or a, a future submittal prior to a building permit application, but um, things that you know should be sort of vetted a little bit more. Um, another issue we talked about was access and parking, um, both like we mentioned during construction, I think that's probably one of my bigger concerns is you know, where are all the folks gonna go to park during construction? Because I had an opportunity to talk to the abutting landowner who owns um, Armont Fuel there. Um, he was saying it's like when, when it's time to do inspection stickers, you know, he's got people queued up on that street all the way up the street waiting for an inspection sticker. And then he's got trucks that need to come and go you know, in the morning and in the evening. So you know, we wanna make sure that anything that the project needs to, to compromise the right of way, that it's well thought and it's not sort of putting him in a tough spot. Um, we also talked a little bit about fire access. Um, building is kind of, it's small, so there's not, you know, big long walks for fire, the fire department. The whole front obviously is open 
they have the uh, the courtyard space really accessible from um, the street, so that's that's not an issue. Um, it, it is bounded on three sides by other properties, and the building is probably within four or five feet of the property line. So we suggested just getting a bit of um, confirmation from the fire chief that he's on board with with what they're proposing and and what he needs to do to to respond to a, an emergency uh, situation there. One of the other things that we talked a bit about too was um, you know there's no real obvious space for deliveries or service vehicles or trash pickup um, the street is relatively narrow so it's it's just over 24 feet wide so it doesn't really have a whole lot of room for a parking lane or a, or a dedicated parking lane um, people do park along that I, I parked along it and there were a couple other cars there so I think as a practical matter it happens um, so I I don't I don't think there's any sort of criticality to that discussion, but it would be nice to sort of get a, an understanding as to what the project's expectations were. Um, then one of the things we talked about too briefly was the, the justification for the parking at um, two, uh, one space per two units. And the only thing that I was wanted to mention was that the section that they're relying on to do that parking is 615. And it just requires justification. So there's usually you, you can you can take credit for that parking reduction, um, but it does require some justification. So perhaps maybe a memo or something to the board that speaks to that um, requirement, or the board could simply waive that requirement as part of the uh, the, the process. Um, then the last thing we discussed was stormwater. Um, so something that we talked about, so, sort of a bit about. They have an infiltration system proposed underneath the garage. Um, this project is kind of in a interesting spot because it doesn't require CONCOM approval. Um, it's less than an acre, so it doesn't need what's called a NIPTES stormwater permit. So really the only thing that applies that deals with stormwater is the town stormwater bylaw. Um, I didn't see any waiver requests from that bylaw and that bylaw is pretty tough. So um, what I would suggest is, is consider if there are things in that that really are, are too heavy of a lift to make sense and, and maybe perhaps consider asking for a waiver from the board from certain aspects of that bylaw. Um, and yeah, the site is, from a stormwater standpoint, I mean, at one point it was a completely impervious site, right? It had a building and it was all paved. Now it's got all sorts of sort of stuff stockpiled around that sort of make it appear like it's um, not impervious, but I, I would consider what's being proposed there as a sort of a net benefit, clearly a benefit to water quality because basically it's it's clean roof water. So I would hate to see the project sort of jump through hoops or try to spend a bunch of money to sort of meet a hurdle for water quality when the project is clearly an improvement over current conditions. Um, and also similarly, it's, it's pretty close to a net zero gain on impervious. So I, I, again, I would, I would see if there's ways that we can sort of look at the requirements of the local bylaw and, and, and sort of consider some relief there to, to, to make it a little bit more uh, achievable or a little bit easier to comply with. Um, and the last thing I noticed that I didn't discuss at the meeting the other day, but I just didn't see a lighting plan or anything as part of the submittal. So if, if, if there's anything that the project team has related to lighting, it would be good to get that on the record. Um, that being said, like uh, Mr. Hanlon said, I'm gonna put a letter together. In this case, I wanna take a little bit more time because I'm trying to make it as much of a closure letter as possible because I think all the issues can be handled relatively straightforward. Um, I just need to sort of pick the right words and the right recommendations to, to sort of help Paul close them out properly. But again, great project, great team, you know, great submittals, um, just a few things that just, need to be discussed for the purposes of getting everybody expecting the same things going forward. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gruden. Um, I think that the most efficient way to do this subject to the, if there's any board member who wishes to ask questions of Mr. Gruden right now, uh, you could do that, but I wonder it might be more efficient to uh, hear a response from the applicant first and then to deal with both at the same time. So with your consent, I would propose to do that. 
Okay, seeing no objection. Uh, Ms. O'Connor, I guess I'll turn it over to you to be mis mistress of steroids. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. I think we'll start with util architecture and bald hill builders first to address um, not only the uh, matters raised by Mr. Reard and Tetra Tech, but some of the other the board's other concerns, such as the shadow study at, uh, on Michael Street. So, um, if I could, Nick or Rochelle. Sure. Well, I don't. Um, I think it's probably best to introduce Matt Gross Handler, um, who's uh, from Baltail Builders and our pre construction advisor at this point. And um, we've been working with Matt and his team. Well, UTL has actually worked with Matt and his team on a number of affordable housing projects. And we recently brought them on board to work with uh, Housing Corporation of Arlington on this project. And we've had a few initial meetings. It's obviously very early in the process to have a lot of detailed information, but I think the issue that Sean brought up about constructability and a construction management plan are spot on. And we have had some initial thoughts about that. And I'll invite Matt to maybe share some high level thinking and I'm happy to answer any any questions or add anything that might be relevant to the design um, based on that. Absolutely, and I, I'm thank you, uh, Matt Grosshandler with Bald Hill Builders. I was writing feverishly as Mr. Rudin was speaking. I think I caught about a dozen notes there, probably nine of which fall under our purview anyway. So uh, might as well take the first bite at the apple. Uh, just by quick background, uh, again, Matt Grosshandler with Bald Hill. We are commercial builders, contractors, and uh, the majority of our work is affordable housing, multifamily uh, projects. The majority of it is in, in urban infill type settings. Uh, so we're no stranger to zero lot line sites, tight urban infill, um, redevelopment, brownfield sites. Uh, this is what we do is our bread and butter. I think we have eight of them under construction right now, uh, all in the same exact size, magnitude and, and type of uh, project range. Uh, with that being said, uh, and I, I will go through uh, Mr. Reardon's list here um, and just comment on some of the items. I will say that your point was spot on about uh, ultimately agreeing to and submitting a formal construction management plan, a CMP. Uh, we will do that. We'll work uh, with the DPW, with fire, with traffic, uh, with police, with Mr. Reardon and his team uh, to make sure that ultimately uh, that all of the issues have been addressed in the final submission. Uh, but in, in doing so, uh, our intent is to stay within the confines of our site with some minor caveats. To the extent that we're working outside of the site, it would be with the permission and, and cooperation of uh, you know, Butter or, or for instance, the, the town. Um, and that would hold true, I think, in almost all regards. Uh, we talked about the site being constrained on three sides. In fact, that is the case. We, we've actually done cut throughs and sections through all three of those elevations. Um, we do believe that there'll be a, a combination of uh, different SOE soil retaining systems that we'll put in, uh, whether it be soldier piles and lagging, or in some cases we may use like concrete bin blocks, uh, depending on the depth of the cut and, and the impact uh, to the adjacent uh, properties. But we'll make sure that that work is being done in a way that's coordinated and, and, uh, and calculated such that the work is uh, relatively confined uh, to our property. And if not, then certainly with the permission of abutters. Uh, to that and the only other thing I could think of that may uh, fall outside of our line is on the fourth property line, which is the uh, where the sidewalk is and, and where we abut uh, Sunnyside the right of way. Uh, as it exists today, it's a it's an asphalt sidewalk. Uh, part of the project obviously includes cleaning that up, clean, doing utility tie-ins. There's a significant amount of work that really happens along uh, along Sunnyside uh, to both facilitate the project and to improve the, the, the neighborhood upon completion of the job. Um, our intent would be to work with again DPW, Mr. Reardon, and others uh, to perhaps take not just the sidewalk, but maybe up to and just past that curb line, even put the, the, the simple act of putting in curbing typically requires a couple of feet beyond the curb itself to actually set the curb and get it embedded properly and, and so on. So we would look to put, whether it's a, a fence line or a Jersey barrier line along the sunny side. And again, we'd work with, with others on exactly how that's accomplished. Uh, we would redirect traffic to the extent there is foot traffic, redirect traffic to the other side. We'll make sure there's proper signage in place. We'll make sure there's barriers in place for pedestrian safety and so on. Uh, so I think the, with regard to the actual property lines, uh, the fence will be, uh, the site will be fenced in. Uh, we'll maintain safety and, and obviously OSHA compliance all throughout the project. Um, 
beyond that, how do you support this? So I think that answers hopefully the, the first question. Again, that'll all be articulated in a plan that we'll submit for consideration and uh, will include, include other people's feedback as well. Uh, with regard to the second point, which was uh, how to support construction through trailer and lay down and so on. Uh, in a perfect world, I'd love to tell you that all of our jobs have trailers. Um, that's not always the case. Sometimes we end up building or accelerating the construction of a particular component on site to allow for um, uh, allow for a field office in the field itself. Uh, we're actually doing that on a couple of jobs right now where we may accelerate the construction of the bike storage room, for instance, and make that a temporary field office. Um, in other instances, we may rent uh, either some parking space from an abutter or rent a local apartment or, or a local storefront and have just an adjacency uh, to the site, not, not physically on the site. Our goal typically is to avoid putting trailers in the right of way, uh, mostly because I can move fences, I can move Jersey barriers, and then have a snow emergency. It's much harder to, to go and disconnect utilities and, and, and really work with the local municipality to, to make that a safe environment. So we try to avoid uh, putting trailers in the street. Um, the, uh, so lay down and trailers. So most of the urban work we're doing, um, lay down really doesn't exist um, a ton on site, we end up um, changing our logic and, and our logistics and how we build such that we end up live loading uh, an awful lot of, well, first of all, live loading debris and soils to be removed, uh, both through the demolition and the, through the site process, but also live loading, you know, concrete structures and steel and concrete and wood, you know, frame members and so on throughout the project. Uh, so we would have typically like a designated uh, delivery lane uh, that we would work with municipality again on on how to coordinate that uh, to the extent there's ever you know a crane day or, or something that would require one-way traffic we'd work with uh, police and fire on access and police details and so on but we'd make sure that uh, it's always done in a safe and workmanlike uh, manner um, I think that addresses to uh, again feel free anybody have any questions feel free to interrupt me as I go uh, regarding uh, number three, public safety, uh, that is our uh, our first and foremost um, uh, priority, not just public safety, but also worker safety. And so anything that we need to do to maintain a fully safe and compliant site is going to be the number one objective of the job. Uh, we always say in our company that everybody goes home safe, everybody goes home every night. And, uh, and that's a, a major component to the way we run work. So making sure that, again, we talked about um, uh, you know, relocating the public, you know, the pedestrian way. Uh, sometimes we'll go in and, and stripe temporary crosswalks or, you know, certainly with signage at a minimum. And, um, and so we'll, we'll work with DPW and others on that. Uh, the fourth item, um, I think I kind of hit already, which is uh, the access in the public way. Um, the goal will be to minimize disruption and interruption. Uh, I do recognize Ms. Reardon pointed out adequately that uh, there's not a lot of traffic on that road. I think that works in our favor. Um, just, I don't know if anybody here cares, but a quick little side note, I just came back from a trip out in uh, Canada uh, with my son and I was joking because everywhere you turn around, there were these cranes parked in the middle of the street and they just, the, the cities just let them shut the roads down. I can tell you, we do a lot of work at Sunville, Boston, Cambridge, and, and I don't think we ever shut roads down. <laughs> uh, the, the, it's, it's always our goal to maintain public way uh, as much as possible. Uh, I, although it would be nice, I, it's never our first, our first uh, option. Um, the fifth item you mentioned was around sedimentation and erosion control. Uh, so the entirety of the project, first of all, the majority of our site is actually depressed. Um, so the, the street level is right around uh, 15, 7, 5, I believe, and it kind of steps up back to about elevation 20 towards the rear elevation and steps along both, both sides, left and right. Um, the footing and the foundation elevation, the cuts of the site are, are lower then, you know, to get the footings and the utilities and all this stuff are lower than the adjacencies. That is somewhat um, not necessarily nice or convenient, but it allows us to keep low points within the site that we can control sediment, uh, we can control water runoff, we can have localized pump uh, locations. Uh, we'll make sure we have siltation controls or, or waddles and, and so on to keep sediment running off the site. As the grade comes up and we get to the finished elevation, which is right around 16, uh, we get to that finished elevation, um, we would have a, a, a wheel wash, which is really like crushed stone that would be for any vehicles exiting and entering uh, the site to, to prevent you know, mud from going into the public way. Uh, we would make sure that to the extent that mud is in the public way, it gets swept daily and so on. Um, so we would certainly be all over sedimentation control and, uh, and erosion control uh, throughout the site. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, just from a sheer means and methods, as the building goes vertical and as we come out of the hole, 
um, at that point, we're, we're coming out of the hole of concrete and, and, and other, you know, materials that don't have sediment. And so it becomes a much easier site to maintain. Uh, and, and really, the, the sediment happens at a lower elevation. And so it, it should be relatively uh, straightforward. Um, soil stockpiling. Um, I, I don't think you'll see a whole lot of it here. There is, it is a cut site um, initially, at least to get the footings and foundations, the underground utilities. In a perfect world, we would uh, we'd probably sit on some of that material. Uh, in a realistic world, we end up you know, juggling around too much and it becomes cumbersome and short of, uh, short of maybe leasing some a parking lot space or something, which very seldom happens. Really what we'd end up doing is disposing and then, and then uh, importing new when the time is appropriate. Um, I think you're gonna find that's gonna end up being the case anyway, by the time you're done with structural fill and crushed stone and the other drainage materials we'll need for the, uh, the stormwater recharge and, and other systems on the site. Uh, the next comment had to do with access and parking. Uh, typically, these sites, we will set up a, a, a dual gate scenario. Um, we do that for, for both convenience. We do it for some compliance reasons, uh, but we'll end up having uh, both, uh, both accesses off of Sunnyside. Um, those will be done through temporary fence rental systems that we'll, we'll have on site. Um, parking. We should generally, and again, keep in mind that most of our subcontractor base is used to working in urban environments. We generally recommend public transportation. We recommend commuting together or carpooling together rather. Um, you know, a lot of our uh, subs that are really used to the urban environment already have, you know, 13 per passenger vans. So they'll, they'll come in, they all meet together at a park and ride and they drive in together. Uh, so as to not have to park 13 vehicles, they park one van. And so really the, the amount of parking would be reduced. Uh, we would typically look to accommodate that parking either in a local municipal lot or by renting some surface parking somewhere or by fi finding, you know, legal on, on street parking, uh, you know, within proximity of the site. The, uh, the next item you mentioned was around fire access. Um, it, it is fairly common. In fact, I think I do it on every job regardless, even if it's required uh, to have open dialogue with the fire department in our CMP. Uh, we do that because number one, we want them to be familiar with the site. I know that the old joke is, you know, some sites will, will, will arrange a key or access and they always joke and say, I have a key. Because of course they're talking about the jaws of life or, or just driving down a fence. Uh, but we do wanna make sure that, that they understand the site, not just you know, uh, in its current condition, but in its various stages throughout the project. Uh, one of the SOPs we put in place, we actually were the first, pro first company ever to, to obtain a building permit post some of the arson and fire uh, wood framework in Boston several years back. I worked with the, the uh, fire department in the city of Boston and came up with protocol on how to build wood frame uh, unprotected construction. Um, and one of the things that we do is as we go vertical on a site, we build a dry stand pipe, even though it's not required by any code, it's, it's our company SOP. Uh, we'll have uh, signage that indicates where the stand pipe connections are. We'll make sure that, you know, it, it, we have uh, access and coordination with the fire department or the, or the fire marshal on how to do that throughout construction. And, and that communication chain stays open. Our superintendent will have you know, periodic conversations with them just to make sure everybody's happy and, and, and clear on what, what's happening. Uh, the ninth point had to do with uh, deliveries. And, oh, that, that, this is what I think why I passed my pass the torch. The deliveries and the service and the permanent condition. Uh, I'll, I'll pass on that one. I'll pass on the parking one. I'll pass on the stormwater one um, and the lighting one. I will comment quickly on though the uh, the twenty foot four foot wide access. Um, 24 foot is actually a very favorable uh, with considering there's not dedicated parking. Um, typically we try to maintain a 20 foot drive path. And so, you know, to the extent that I am looking to take some of the public way or right of way to get utility tie, tied in and to, you know, set the curbing and the new, new sidewalk and some of that other work, you know, if we had to encroach into the right of way, you know, three or four feet, that it would still maintain two way traffic, even if, and again, we could work, sometimes we'll do cones down the middle, uh, sometimes we'll temporary stripe, it all depends. I know the asphalt there is not in the greatest condition and I'm not sure what the town's plan is to redo that in time or, or whatnot, but we would definitely work with the DPW to make sure that whatever plan is uh, is ultimately agreed upon is, is collaborative and, and, and working towards an end goal. So I think I've answered uh, Mr. Reardon's questions or comments. I'm happy to answer any more if, uh, if you have any further questions. Thank you. I, thank you very much, Mr. Grossman, Gross Handler. Nick, is Mr. Burns is uh, sure. Yeah, I can I can jump in. Um, I, I might just circle back um, 
Sean, on the sedimentation and erosion control, I think, you know, Matt provided some background from a construction management standpoint. I didn't know if there were any specific questions in terms of the design materials that were submitted by CMEOTIS that you were queuing into there with your comment there, if you wanted to have Jeff um, offer anything or if, if you're satisfied. No, more it was just a sort of a, a rehatch of what we discussed during our meeting, but yeah, yeah I, okay. Not, nothing there that needs to be sort of discussed further. Right. I did want to reiterate, um, thanks Matt for your perspective on, on um, fire access management during construction. I think Sean had also alluded to maybe some concerns about fire department access and the finished condition and you know, just forever for the record, we did have a meeting with um, a number of the town department heads, including the fire chief, where they reviewed our preliminary plans, um, and we received some similar questions about the clearances around the site and some of the dimensions to the back of the site. There was not any major concern, um, nor have we received any formal comments from the fire department uh, from our um, uh, formal application for the, the 40 B process. But we're happy to confirm again with the fire chief uh, that they don't uh, see any um, outstanding issues with the design. Yeah, Nick, uh, if I can just jump in uh, real quick, just, just for, for background, yep. what, what, what I try to sometimes do might sound a bit pedantic, but keep in mind that what we're trying to do is, is form the record for the decision. Yep. So you know, even if it's just a, a brief summary of your conversation, something to introduce to the record, so that the board has something written or or docu some documentation to rely on. Yep, so that, absolutely. That's like even what Matt just said, if we can get a draft plan or even a memo that that sort of rehashes those same points, then you know that gets introduced to the record and everybody has it. And you know, it's the difference between having sort of foundation for their decision as opposed to not. Yeah, absolutely. And and it was my understanding from our previous conversation that. You'll be submitting formal comments. We'll be submitting a formal response for the record, and the board yep. will have that for their reference. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one, one other quick side note to yeah, that is yes. that so not just will ultimately you'll see. I, w I could try to pull together. I'll, 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 you know, Nick and I and the client and I will we'll, uh, huddle up here, and you know, I could see if there's some way to accelerate a, a, a preliminary CMP or something. It won't have been reviewed with all the different departments we talked about, but at least give you some ideas of what we're thinking. Um, the other thing that we typically will do, and again, it's somewhat early, but we would do it as, as part of SOP anyway, is we put together an NFPA 241, which is a, um, a temporary construction access uh, plan. And so that that addresses the safety, that will address the fire department concerns, that'll address all those other, you know, how we maintain site security, et cetera, um, throughout the project. And so we typically develop that, you know, right and submit it along with our building permit or, or some cities require it with a building permit uh, application, some don't, but that's typically the timing of it. Um, but I'm happy, you know, we could probably put together some bullet points just to let you know what's coming. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, on the point regarding um, deliveries, drop off, trash pickup, uh, basically cur curb designations on the public right of way, um, I think you know we had expressed interest in our application um, with coordinating with the town engineer about what the appropriate designations along Sunnyside would be. I think our proposal is to um, you know provide signage of some sort, whether that's a you know loading only zone or a 15 minute parking zone. I think we're relying on the town to provide some input there. About what they'd like to see directly in front of the building that will facilitate, you know, Ubers, um, you know, trash pickup, uh, other types of, you know, Amazon, UPS, all that kind of stuff. Um, Mr. Burns, that that comment that you just made refers uh, primarily to when the building is in operation, correct? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Was there a separate question about about those issues? No, we were just going back and forth between Mr. Gross Handler and you, and yep. that's also between the construction management and you, and it gets a little confusing. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. Understood. Um, the comment regarding the justification of the parking reduction, I might ask Mary to weigh in on, you know, from a, a legal or procedural standpoint, how we'd like to address that. But I think we, you know, have spoken at previous hearings and in our application about the clients uh, or you know the owner's assessment of what their needs are for parking and how it's at the board's discretion to make an allowance to reduce the required parking. Uh, yes, uh, before I do that, Nick, why don't you address the shadow study on for Michael Street? Oh, sure. Why don't you know if you don't mind, Mary, maybe I'll just keep I'll finish going through the list of items right. from Sean and then we can touch on the shadow study. Sure. Um, the last quick one, I think, is the lighting plan. And Sean, um, we did 
develop and submit and present a lighting plan at our last hearing. So I don't know if you were not able to gain access to that, but happy to share that with you um, and discuss in any more detail. But that was a, an earlier request from the board that we have fulfilled. And I don't believe there were any additional outstanding comments from the board um, based on those materials. Um, I'll ask Jeff to um, address the stormwater design uh, issues, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so thank you, Sean, for that um, that uh, advice. Uh, we'll take a look at our stormwater calcs and see what we can do to minimize the size of the system um, and see if the, the bylaw waiver is feasible for our, our, our scenario. Um, we anticipate some uh, stormwater infiltration system uh, within the building. Um, if we could you know, if we could reduce it, that's a uh, great, even a, uh, you know, cost benefit to the, to the client. Yeah. And Jeff, I'm happy to work with you to sort of yeah. reach a sort of a, a cooperative conclusion. Yep. I think between you, uh, myself and uh, the town engineer, we'll, we'll, we'll find the solution for it. Yep. Okay. Any other further questions on that? Mary, do you want to address sure. the reduction at this point, or would you like me sure. to? Bring up the uh, I think, study? Okay. No, I, I think that uh, I would say that I think we have at prior meetings vetted the issue of parking in detail. Uh, because of the uh, this is an affordable housing development, Article Eight gives the ability uh, gives a ten percent reduction in the parking, and the board under Article Six Six Point One Five can can further reduce the parking. We gave you um, statistical data from three comparable size projects that HCA has built, uh, Capitol Square, Broadway, and Lowell Street. And uh, we gave you the number of units, we gave you the number of parking spaces, and we gave you the utilization. And based upon that information, parking was being utilized at about 49%. So uh, we believe that the board has adequate authority to further reduce the parking under Article 6. We've also provided adequate uh, bicycle parking uh, and facilities and where this is um, on a transportation line and adequate transportation, I think there's uh, plenty of uh, support for reducing the parking. Thank you, Mary. You're welcome. Uh, Pat, I'm wondering if we want to pause here and take any other questions or comments regarding Sean's feedback, or I'm happy to share the shadow study follow, which we had also requested. Well, I think we've had a, uh, why don't you take a little break on the shadow study and why don't we see if we can't go through the material. It's already quite a lot, uh, that we already, that we've just done. Uh, and I wonder if there are any, uh, comments or questions from the board. Mr. Chair. Mr. Rieker Deli. Um, I just wanted to ask a follow-up question about um this the street um parking. And we were just talking about the you know loading or drop-off zone. I know this is not necessarily within the, the scope of the project um uh, because it's on the street, but just wondering, is is this street wide enough to accommodate that in any case? It, it, even if it, even if the town uh were willing to designate a spot for drop-off or or um, loading or anything like that? I, I don't think it is. Okay. But that, that being said, it is a very low volume street. So with a fairly robust 24 foot plus width. So if it, it, if it, if a, a delivery vehicle had to pull over to the curb for 10 minutes, certainly not the end of the world. What I just want to do is make sure that it's the the expectation is defined so that everybody knows what to expect going forward so there there aren't any surprises basically so, but, so but there is sorry not enough not enough room to accommodate a, a, a on-street parking okay so so, so in that case just as a follow-up question in that case um it wouldn't be typical for them to sign or designate a spot for that because it, it wouldn't be a, a real parking zone right it would just be a sort of unofficial people stop and there's enough room to go around them. Right, I think you can call it like a no standing zone or something like that. Okay. Uh, I'll just add that the existing condition, the town allows 
parking on both sides of the street and, and the street, you know, allows two way traffic. And I think we heard from board members and from abutters during our site visit and during, you know, these meetings that it's very, very tight and very congested. And so I think that's why we're looking to receive a recommendation from the town as to, you know, how they want to proceed, you know, with this redevelopment. There's obviously no curb, no sidewalk in front of our property or in front of the Armont fuel property. And so, you know, what the future condition of the block becomes and what's allowed, you know, on the curb line or not, and whether or not traffic, you know, gets constrained in other ways, I think is really up to the town, not up to the applicant. Yeah, understood. I, I think it would be good to get that feedback from, from the town because I, I think, um, you know, having driven down the street many times uh, and ridden my bike down here too, that uh, it's it it's, feels like sort of a tight street and yep. when someone's parked on the side of it, it feels much tighter. So, yeah, thank you. Is there anything else from the board? Uh, Mr. Chair? Um, I did, Mr. LeBlanc. Um, kind of going back to kind of our constructability <clears throat> items and, and the like, uh, I was just wondering, it sounds like, you know, soil is going to be taken off the site. Uh, so I was just curious if there was any, um, anyone on the, the team that could do a soil characterization or if there was a plan for that um, later, given probably the amount of soil that might have to be taken off the site. Um, I know, I know in your materials, you have done some soil, soil testing already, but that seems more hydrology related rather than, um, you know, any hazardous material or the makeup of that soil, especially given the current use of that property. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to uh, speak to that briefly. And if Eric or Gabby or Matt wants to chime in, please do. Um, you know, there was, like you alluded to, there was there were geotechnical investigations that happened. There were also uh, both phase one and phase two environmental reports that were performed that in, included testing, and those were found to be clean. Typically, soil characterization for the project will happen either directly prior to construction or, you know, at the onset of construction, and that will inform, you know, the soil removal plan and where, you know, that material needs to go to which types of facilities. So that'll definitely be taking place. Um, I don't know if you know, others on the team want to add any more detail to that? Nick, I, I can say in response to is there is no place in Massachusetts that I know of that will accept excavated soil without documentation as to its origin. Yeah. Yeah. So you, 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 the days of being able to bring it somewhere without having documentation are gone. I'm sure you're, you're spot on. Every one of our sites has characterization and, you know, uh, receiving facilities that have their own analysts and their own uh, scientists that do the analysis on that. So that'll 100% be the case here. That's all I have. Mr. Lebanc? That's all I have. Is there anything else? Going once. Going twice. Okay, so we will now into the shadows. Um, I guess, Mr. Burens, you can start on this one. Sure, why don't I uh, share my screen here? Bear with me. Mr. Hanlon, I don't know if we'll need Mr. Lee to give um, uh, co-host permissions in order to uh, allow the sharing. Mr. Mr. Lee still here? There we go. He is here. Mr. Lee, can you do that? Shell, are you able to access the um, shadow studies? I'm just having some technical issues on my side. I think that our problem may very well be that the person who is the host and who can give you clearance to do that 
is oh i haven't even i haven't even tried to share my screen yet i'm just trying to access the, oh the all right well why don't we work <laughs> on our problem for why you work on yours if you yeah if you can if you can get it pulled up it's not loading for me for some reason yeah i, I do have it on my screen but I, I i am disabled from being able to share my screen okay mr klein you are the co-host uh, are you able to do that I was looking to see if I have that ability. I do not appear to have that ability. I believe it's under security if. Yeah. While we're waiting, um, Nick, I did find the lighting plan. Thank you for directing me to the okay, middle. Okay, great. Um, was there, did you guys have any plan to do lighting on the uh, deck? We definitely will have some level of exterior lighting on the deck. We haven't gotten to that level. And I think the, the board and Abutter's initial concerns were specifically about street level lighting and public safety. So that's where we focused our efforts and our response. But yes, we will, we will have some sort of illumination up there as well. All right, when that, when that information is available, if you can share it, that'd be great. Sure. Yeah. Why don't we we can coordinate with um, our um, landscape architect on that. So, so it's not clear to me what to do. I think that probably at this point, in order to keep everybody from just from uh, wasting a lot of time. Uh, what I think I'll do is is open the public hearing. Uh, we'll have only the we encourage commenters to deal only with the matters that have already. Been. Hello, uh, Mr. Hanlon. Yes. Might I suggest uh, Mr. Zamalk was on and he was going to speak to the Michael Street issue. Um, and, yes. Uh, so if, if we could allow him to speak to that. If you can yeah. do that without the pictures, that's fine. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah. So th there obviously was, you know, there was concern last time uh, about traffic on Michael Street. Um, you know, then then we wanted to also look at the comparison to what the previous use was because when we did our study, that use wasn't um, obviously open, so we couldn't collect any traffic data. That um, basically what we found is, you know, the the uh, auto body shop uh, generated about 10 to 11 trips in the peak hours and the housing development is, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, going to generate about 15 to 20 in the peak hours. So we're talking a very minimal change. And um, like we kind of emphasized in the uh, report, you know, most of the traffic or a majority of the traffic will go to uh, Broadway. The, the, there is a chance because nobody is directing the traffic that um, they will use Michael Street. However, if you know, for argument's sake, you say 20% of all those trips uh, use Michael Street, that's one trip every half hour or you know, in the evening, one trip every 15 minutes. So you're not going to feel any difference at all. So um, I think, you know, based on the numbers and the anticipated distribution, I think. You could basically say, you know, the added trips on Michael Street will be negligible. Great. Thank you, Mr. Zamok. I, I take it that even if the people who lived on Michael Street didn't consider them negligible now, that is to say they, they see more than they would like to see coming through. What well, your point is, is that the delta, the increment that would be attributable to the site would be very small. Is that correct? Very, that is correct. Very small. Okay. All right, Mr. Are is prepared to circle back. I see that I have the ability to screen share. Yes, yes, Mr. Zamolka, great job. Okay. All right. Are you seeing shadow studies? Yes, we are. Nick, do you want to speak to them, or do you want me to do that? Uh, I guess I'll proceed. Um, so. When we talked last meeting, we were requested by the board to provide a more detailed breakdown of what's happening during the winter solstice. 
Um, so we covered from noon to 4.30, which is sunset. And what you see in gray is existing shadow conditions. What you see in the blue is the addition of the new proposed building. Uh, what we found with the breakdown is that we start to get shadowing on, um, that's 40, 43 Michael Street um, at around four o'clock, which is half an hour before sunset. At three o'clock, which is on the upper um, right corner there, um, the shadow that's cast is, is primarily coming from the existing. The new is within the footprint of the existing shadow. Okay, and, and I can't really make this out very clearly, but does the shadow uh, affect, I think it's numbers 35 and 37 or 35 and 39, the ones next to? It's not touching 43. 35. It, it seems to kind of work in tandem with um, sort of on the same, the edge of the shadow meets the edge of the shadow of the uh, adjacent Arlemont fuel grazing 39. Um, but it's it's not really substantive. Like it's what you see there, that little sliver of blue is on out the outside edge of the perimeter of 39. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. So are there any questions from the board on either of the last two points that we've talked about, uh, what Mr. Zamolka had to say and what Ms. Ain had to say? Mr. 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 Riccardelli. I, I just want to say, uh, I think it's thank you for um, addressing both those concerns, the traffic on Michael Street, as well as the, the shadow say I think that's very helpful. And, and I hope the neighbors uh, feel that it's helpful as well. We'll see coming up. It was, there was, there, was there someone else who was seeking attention when I called on Mr. Riccadelli? Mr. Chair. Mr. Klein. Um, the other aspect on the solar study that we had requested additional information on um, was trying to get something that was a little more um, uh, some, some actual figures on sort of the amount of time. Um, I know this sort of indicates that sort of about half an hour um, at the solstice in the winter time, and then I believe that I'm just trying to recall from the 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 prior hearing, um, it did appear that it was really it was only in these these circumstances where the the solar impact, where the shadow impact was really um, on those two corner, that corner house and the house adjacent to it on Michael Street. Um, and I wasn't sure if the, the applicant could provide, um, not, that, not at this time, but could provide just a, you know, a little more sort of, of a numeric analysis so we can really um, to be able to demonstrate sort of what the, you know, how many hours per year kind of impact we're anticipating that this this might have um, my my sense is that it's going to be a very low number, um, but I do think it would be helpful for the for the for the neighbors and for the abutters to to have a better sense of that impact. Okay, thank you, Mr. Klein. All right, are, is there any other discussion from the board? Seeing none. Um, it's now time to open the public the meeting to public comment. Uh, many of you have already uh, been through this uh, more than once, uh, but just in case you've forgotten, public comments and questions and comments will only be taken as they relate to the matter at hand, and they should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. Uh, members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the participant tab in the Zoom application. Those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you'd like to speak. You will be called upon by the meeting host. You will be asked to give your name and address, and you will be given time for questions and comments. Uh, all questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak um, uh, to speak clearly. Anyone wishing to address the board a second time during any particular hearing, the chair will allow those wishing to sp speak for the first time um, <clears throat> to speak first. Uh, once all public questions and comments have been addressed or the allocated time has ended, the public uh, comment period will be closed and the board and staff will do our best to show documents being discussed. Um, I think that where we are right now is it's uh, uh, 
it's 837 and so why don't we start at the at the we'll aim for trying to do this by around 920. Um, okay, uh, the first person I see with a hand up so far the only person is Monique Chaplin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Monique Chaplin, 35 Michael Street. Uh, first, I just want to express my appreciation for the additional shade study. Uh, I appreciate that uh, extra thought was given to that, and I'll be interested in hearing um, the results of Mr. Klein's suggestion. Um, as we uh, anticipate uh, construction vehicles in the area, um, I am, would like to request whether it would be possible to ask that construction vehicles not park on uh, Michael Street and that uh, they park perhaps on Broadway with a permit so that Michael Street's also kind of a narrow street and if people are parking and there's driveways that uh, are directly across from parking areas, which makes it difficult for people to get out of their driveways. So I'm concerned if too many either uh, construction workers or construction vehicles are parking on Michael Street, it'll be difficult for people to get in and out. Thank you, Ms. Chapel. Thank you. So anyone have a, I guess, Mr. Gross, uh, Gross Handler, are you still here? I don't know. Mr. Yes, you're. I, I Does that make here. sense to you? For, at least from from the point of view of, uh, I mean, you, the the construction management is going to be actually the, at issue when we're dealing with during construction, where um, e either equipment or cars or whatever is going to park. Um, what would your view be if uh, we had a condition, for example, that uh, that forbid parking on Michael Street for uh, for those uses as, as part of the construction process. So at a high level, ideally, I'd like to really review the actual CMP and the traffic and delivery routes and, and so on. And, and I just haven't uh, haven't really pulled that study together yet, but certainly will. Um, the thing I would suggest um, at a minimum is that the other thing I, I didn't mention earlier, but we do throughout the project is we have neighborhood coordination meetings. Uh, we'll typically offer them either monthly or every other month, depending on uh, you know what people want and what people's tolerance for the disruption is. Uh, in those meetings, we would announce things like, you know, concrete pour days or, you know, crane days and so on, which tend to be the more impactful uh, durations. You know, when you're pouring concrete, if I have, you know, 40 concrete trucks queuing up for that, that pour, you only have, you know, so many minutes to start pouring concrete before the concrete gets hard, you know, so um, typically in those instances, we'll communicate that a week or two or more in advance to say, okay, you know, everybody be advised on Thursday, the whatever will be, you know, anticipating a, a higher than normal demand. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I found that, you know, to the extent that we're respectful of, uh, of the community, the community tends to be respectful of the process and we'll work with whatever's practicable at the time uh, to work hand in hand, if that helps answer that question. Thank you, sir. Ms. Chaplin, are you okay? You said, are we, should I move on to Mr. Acosta? Uh, thank you, that, that's uh, helpful. Okay, thank you. Mr. Acosta. Uh, uh, I would like to thank the board for uh, putting the effort into the shadow study or, or the applicant as well. Um, that actually is helpful, I think. I'm a little concerned that there's still a little shadow on, on my property. Um, I, I, I'm also concerned about uh, the construction during and during con the traffic during construction and while building is active, uh, the almond fuel trucks are are somewhat big, so that it's not like a regular, um, you know, car traffic. If you're starting to have like trying to fit two or th two trucks side by side with even with one car in the parking, it, I think it's just going to be a mess. Um, also, I, I, again, I'll, I'll revoice my concern about not the building not having the setbacks uh, required or enough parking. I, I do appreciate that it's on a transit line and, and biking, but it is, again, New England in the winter and uh, the, the 
transportation is, is not as good as it's made seem, um, especially late at night, the routes don't run as often. So a, a car or growth for uh, car usage, I think would be advisable to start with a project where you're hundred percent utilizing your parking. It just doesn't load well. Mr. Costa, by a hundred percent, you mean having parking spaces for all forty for all forty three houses, or you mean something else? No, no. I mean, I mean, if you if you allocate fifty, whatever the the ten percent discount minus the utilization that was modeled, uh, I think that comes out at at the exact number that the plan is built. So basically, you have zero room for growth or expansion. Uh, I mean, I noticed here on the street, it varies. We we started with a few cars, and as the kids grow older, people got more cars, and then the kids move away, you get less cars. So, just being at a hundred percent utilization with such parking space, it, it even for visitors, it makes sense to have a few parking spaces open. And uh, I I mean I still again the setbacks are a concern, but uh, I, I understand the cost project is. Uh, I understand what the applicant is trying to do by maximizing the space to keep the the cost reasonable, which which I mean it, it, it's it's understandable, but I'm still concerned that the building is is too big for the character of the neighborhood. Um, I, I do think four four floors would be better, but I understand there's a cost aspect to it. Uh, thanks for the time. Okay, thank you, Mr. Acosta. Is there anybody? Yell? I actually don't see any other hands. Going once. Oh, Mr. Moore. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. I couldn't let a meeting go on by without saying something, of course. Um, I want to applaud Lucilla Blank's comments about the soil and the concern about the soil to do with um, the fact that uh, this site, I know that I, I, I'm repeating myself because I raised this issue before. Um, but I want to ask a question. The, when the, um, you know, someone had a name for the report, when the soil is uh, analyzed and differentiated or whatever, is a report made to any town body of the results of that report? Yeah, I wonder, Ms. O'Connor, who would be best suited to answer that question? I think uh, maybe site civil. Is it possible just to, to hear that question one more time? Did you oh, say sure, oh, sure, sure. Um, the, the, the question is when, when the soil is, you said that uh, determination is made right when you actually do the excavation, although I know there's been many test pits dug and such. Um, when that determination gets made and when uh, some mitigation plan, if there's something wrong with the soil, is developed. Does a report get made to any town board or body about that, like the inspector's office or some such? I, I would just point out that there was a tw full 21E done with borings at that site, and the site is clean. Right. And I, I understand, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm just asking when that determination is actually made upon excavation of the actual uh, um, pit as opposed to boys. Well, I'd have to defer it to uh, the contractor and uh, Sammy Otis on that. Mr. Grosshandler, could you explain how that process works? And whether particularly the issue here is whether uh, there's any point during that process where a report is made to an agency of the town uh, so that the town knows what's going on as well as, as the others who need to be involved. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really thinking about this because I'm not sure too many towns want to know, right? Because, to, to, you know, when you're, and I'm just thinking out loud here, um, when you're relying on a licensed LSP, licensed uh, professional to do the analysis and, and dictate where it goes, there's, there's sort of, there's no liability to the town in that regard. Once the town injects itself as an authority, I don't know. I feel like most cities and towns they want to know what's happening, but they don't. They don't ask to get copied. They, they almost. They just. They want to know that there's that the compliance is happening. That there's a licensed engineer that's putting the name on it. They don't typically get into the weeds more than that. And I, I might be able to help here. Um, so, Sean, the, the, the process they're talking about is, is 
called the MC pro C process, MCP process in Massachusetts, the mass contingency plan. The first step is called what's a phase one analysis. And that's usually a, a cursory evaluation based on the history of the site to determine whether there's any risk that there's any contamination. It, any site that's operated like as an industrial facility or as a car repair place, it's going to trip the next requirement, which is a phase two, which says, okay, you can't eliminate it based on its history. So you need to go out there and do a bit of testing and, and, and confirm that there's either something out there or there's nothing out there. Usually if a phase two finds something, you end up having to notify DEP that there is contamination on site and it gets assigned a release tracking number and then you move to a phase three. The fact that no phase three work was done, it's likely that the phase two came up positive as Mary said. Usually that information is only shared with financiers and, and people that are purchasing the property. So there would be no reason to share that with the town. Uh, Mr. Pierre. Mr. Mr. Moore. Um, but there was some reference to a process where you actually start, when you start digging for a foundation pouring, some determination is made at that point that's separate from the studies which have already been accomplished. For disposal of the material, I think you yourself said there's nowhere in Massachusetts that we can dispose of the material. So someone has to analyze the material for what's found, correct? Yeah, that's wholly depending on the receiving facility. So whoever is accepting the facility, they they say what they need. Whoever is accepting the material, they say what they need from doc for documentation from the generating source, and it's just an agreement between those two parties. Okay, so uh, Mr. Chair, so it sounds like the answer is the town is not informed. The only reason I'm bringing this up and being a stickler about it is we have the Alark Brook close by, and as you know, there's been uh, there's a number of uh, uh, I don't know, sample pits or whatever near, near the brook. And I also understand that this site is, I think, outside the aura. Um, however, Ale Life Book does flood regularly. There's been much uh, sewage contamination issues around this, uh, this brook. And I'm just, I'm concerned that whatever this site uh, will find when it does its digging, and it might behoove the town to be aware of what is discovered. It's my two cents, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Chair, excuse me, Mr. Moore. It, it would be proper, it might be helpful if you have the time and inclination to do this, is to think through a little more uh, what you are uh, suggesting. I guess mm -hmm. the thing that I would like to understand better is what the town would do with the information mm -hmm. that it has. Uh, somehow there needs to be some kind of a of a connection uh, between something that the is the town's responsibility or within the town's legal authority, and what that information uh, is. But uh, and at this point, I don't fully understand what that is. So if if you could, I don't. This is not the time for us to sort of work through that. Right. Right. If uh, if you could could maybe make that a little more precise and give us a little more to work with, that would be helpful. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Is there anyone else who wishes to address this? Could I, we have Rachel in the uh, waiting room. Uh, let me see if I can admit her. I, I think I can, I think I did. I'm sorry, she's joining, but is not yet joined. Um, is there anyone else who wishes to address the application? Going once, going twice. I'm sure Rachel is not going to volunteer. So um, I guess it's time for the chair to close the public hearing. Uh, are there any other uh, questions or comments from members of the board? Okay, well, seeing none. Um, the next step here is going to be to continue uh, the hearing as I indicated at the outset. Um, and I think I just want to make sure that we can confirm that August 1st will work for the board and the others who need to be there at that hearing. Um, I, I believe everybody from the board has either indicated to me that they would be available that day or failed to indicate to me that they haven't. But this is the time to, to 
If we've got a problem, this is the time to identify it. Mr. Haverty, this is that will the first work for you? Yes, it does, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. O'Connor for the applicant. It does. Uh, Mr. Reardon, is that that give you enough time to do what you need to do? It does. Okay. So let's. Uh, I think next time it would, the the agenda would be to go through the the issues that have been raised today by the report and whatever additional issues are um, are going to be uh, uh, raised when we finally have a written report and when there's a back and forth about that. Um, this will also be a good time for everybody to be thinking about what the final stuff is, what the what the loose ends are what the questions are that we need to have answered uh, because we're getting close to a, a time when we uh, are not going to be able to ask those questions anymore or hear any answers to them. So we're getting at that point where it all needs to come together. Um, when we finally finish with the factual findings, uh, or not the findings, but the, the factual inquiry that is like the inquiry that we've been doing. The very last meeting that we will have will be reviewing Mr. Haverty's uh, draft opinion uh, with draft conditions and so forth and taking a look at them, making sure they say what they're supposed to say, making sure that if, they're if they present difficulties that the board is aware of it because this will be our last time uh, to work that out. Um, we have potentially one more day uh, that we've been talking about uh, that might be available in August. That would be the 15th. Uh, later in the month, it would be very difficult, at least if we stuck to Tuesdays, uh, to find a day when the board can all get together. Um, and I guess the question I have, since that puts the burden on Mr. Haverty, and since much of what uh, the, of the coming to closure on Mr. Reardon's report is likely to, to take as late as uh, the first, whether it makes sense to try to do that in only two weeks, given that everybody has to read the report as opposed to just receive it on the first, so on the 15th. So I'm just trying to figure out what, what makes the most sense given your schedule and given the way in which we're planning to unfold. The alternative is to pick a date early in September that will do the final review on the uh, on the language, and I would anticipate that we would close the hearing on that day. Uh, Mr. Chairman, who is that question to? That yeah. to that, I'm sorry, you you can't tell, but I'm staring right at you, Mr. Everett, because <laughs> it's it's basically you the once once we finish figuring out what we have, what we're going to know about the facts. Um, you're the one who's the quarterback at, at that point in, in laying out what the game plan is and giving us something to uh, work with and the public and the applicant something to work with. So two weeks should be enough time for me to get a draft decision to you. And that would be in time for us to read it and to make sure that we can react to it. So I don't want to just get it on the 15th and then discover that sure. we haven't uh, thought about it. I mean, I, I would try to get it to you a week in advance, but I, I can't guarantee that. Okay, uh, that that would be appreciated because you know, given the nature of my clients it being a not-for-profit, time is money for them, and money is very tight for this project. Okay, well, if, Mr. Haverty, if you think you can do that, then I think that what we should try to do uh, is to finish up on the first. If it turns out that's not possible, then the time will slip. Uh, but otherwise, oh, we. And can one thing I can do is to actually get started on it now. So I've got the, the outline right. of it ready to go. And so that'll shave some time off. So yeah, I'll do yeah. that. That will be helpful. Thank you. So if we're lucky, we we're able to, we'll able, we'll be able to close the hearing on the 15th. That gives us 40 days from the 15th. And like the infamous grasshopper, we will play and sing for the next two weeks after that, and then work really hard in September to get this job done. Is that okay with everyone? Yes, thank Perfect. you very much. All right, thanks everyone for your cooperation. I thank you uh, also for the, the public for, for speaking. Uh, this has been another hearing in which I think that we haven't had as big a, a crowd as we've had in the past sometimes, but I very much enjoyed hearing from Mr. Uh, Acosta and Ms. Chaplin and uh, uh, 
and very much welcome, as I think we all do, the contribution that you all have made to the uh, analysis here. I think we'll find that that the project will be a lot better because uh, of what you've been able to do. Um, all right, so at this point, uh, the chair will entertain a motion to continue this uh, session of the hearing to a date certain of August 1, 2023 at 7.30 or as soon thereafter as the matter can be heard. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Klein. So moved. Moved by Mr. Klein. Is uh, there a second? Second, Mr. Chairman. Seconded by Mr. DuPont. Do a roll call, Mr. Klein. Aye. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hoffman, not Mr. Hoffman, I'm sorry, Ms. Hoffman. Aye. And I should say Ms. Holy to make it work out, but I'm not. I'm going to say Mr. Holy. Aye. Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. Mr. Ricardelli. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Okay, so we have discussed a little bit what we're going, where we're trying to going to we're trying to go in this case in terms of the timing. Um, we do have another regular hearing on the twenty seventh, I believe, where we have a continued case for that day, and one new case. Uh, so it it's not uh, it should not be a long hearing. Uh, and I would ask Mr. Klein if there are any other announcements on the schedule reaching into. The next couple of months that uh, he would like us to pay our attention to. Uh, nothing at this point. Um, I'm just still getting my my feet back under me from being away uh, out on on vacation. So um, I know we the the next hearing that the board has uh, has scheduled, um, I believe, is the 25th of July. We do have two things on the agenda for that. One is a continuation from uh, the prior hearing, and one is new. Mm -hmm. um, but that's all I'm aware of for currently for that date. Okay, well, it's summertime and these living is easy. So let me let you all uh, let could get on to your your attractive evening plans. And I look forward very much to seeing you all on uh, August first, if not before. Uh, so the chair would uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. Mr. Chairman, so moved. Mr. Klein moves to adjourn. Uh, is there a second? Second, Mr. Chairman. Seconded by Mr. DuPont. Uh, again, we have to do the roll call because that's part of what we do uh, when we are meeting remotely. Uh, Mr. Klein. Aye. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. Holy. Aye. Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. Mr. Ricardelli. Aye. And the chair votes aye, so we are adjourned. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.